just before sunrise on the morning of Saturday, March 27, 2010, a steel worker was arriving for his shift at the north base of the McKay Bridge in Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. There was something red laying at the base of one of the massive concrete abutments on the frozen earth. As he moved closer, he realized it was a person. Holly Bartlett was found unconscious under the McKay Bridge after a night out with her friends. The 31-year-old's death in March 2010 was ruled an accident. Holly died in hospital less than 48 hours after she was found. Within 72 hours, police had ruled her death accidental, and the case was closed. The initial police investigation was wrapped up really quickly. Drunk, blind girl, case closed. There's a lot of hours in there that we don't know where she was. This has become one case that was never solved, and it should have been. I really would like to know what happened to Holly. Somebody knows. Holly was born on Boxing Day, 1978. One of the nurses came up and uh, said to me, so you know your daughter is blind. I was floored. She's a middle child, very strong personality. And even as a little preschooler, you know, she, she persevered. My name is Holly Bartlett, and I'm 30 years old, and I live in Halifax, Nova Scotia. When I was born, I had an eye condition called microthelmia, which in, you know, layman's terms means small eyes. When I lost my vision around the age of 13, that was a rather traumatic experience, but everything at 13 is traumatic. She always appeared confident, but even when she wasn't and she was very stubborn, but she was also very kind and very loving. I remember one day I was driving and here's my sister walking down the street with her white cane. I hollered out the window, Holly, it's Amanda. She said, I know it's you. <laughs> I said, where are you going? Yoga. <laughs> okay, call me later. But she always had a, there was nothing to lose attitude. We were driving down the street one day, and she said, yeah, I, last weekend I went skydiving. Okay. Here she was going out on the weekends, uh, doing assisted riding and winning medals and ribbons and trophies. I am involved with swing dance. I volunteer on a board for a nonprofit organization. I am completing part-time my master's in public administration. She had friends. She had a social calendar. She always wanted to be known not because of her disability, right? She wasn't scared of going places, and she was quite fine to do that without being accompanied. And I think she taught herself how to do that because she didn't want to depend on anybody else. That's how independent she was. I was too young to realize what a good sister she was and what a good aunt she was to my kids. And I just miss having her around. I miss her jokes. I miss her calling and asking me to pick her up and me getting irritated. <laughs> I miss her laugh. I miss her laugh. I miss it all. I just miss her. I miss, I miss my sister. I had 150% confidence that the police department would do a thorough investigation. I remember when I went into the room and I saw my parents and there was a police officer there. And my mother looked at me and said, they'll find out what happened, Amanda. They're gonna find out because it can't be that hard. She's four foot nothing, blind woman who everybody knew on her street. Someone has to know. We had confidence that we'd get the answer. He told us Monday morning when he came, there are no foul play is suspected. They didn't even have the autopsy done. I said, Mom, ask the police officer if 
the cab driver had GPS on their car. At least then we can rule out, you know, that she was dropped off at the wrong spot or the answer was, Mrs. Bartlett, you watch too much CSI. She had just buried her daughter. It was right then and there that I knew that we would never find out what happened to Holly. It's hard not knowing. It's hard picturing my sister underneath the bridge. She was laying underneath the bridge for five hours, freezing. They treated the case as poor, little, drunk, blind girl. Her death deserved a proper investigation. Somebody out there knows exactly what happened on March 26th. Somebody knows. I was working as a journalist at the time, but I never covered it. I just remember thinking, something's not right. In the weeks following Holly's death, answers were scarce, if not non-existent. The biggest problem here is that the investigation was impeded in the first three days because there was an assumption that was made that Holly got drunk and, oh well, nothing to see here. Police maintain Holly was dropped off at the entrance to her condo building, right at the front door. Investigating officers theorized that Holly, drunk and disoriented, stumbled away from her home. Officers believe she had wandered 350 meters from her front door to the apartment building at Kencrest, crawled through a hole in the fence, crawled up a very steep abutment under the bridge, and then fell 10 meters to the ground below. Her family never found out how she sustained the injury, blunt force trauma to the head that, along with hypothermia, would ultimately claim her life. Security footage from above immediately ruled out jumping. Holly was never on the bridge that night. Peter and Holly met through the Canadian National Institute for the Blind, or CNIB, as it's known today. I can only imagine how painful and traumatic this has been for you and for everyone that cared for Holly to kind of revisit. As soon as this yeah, happened, yeah. you were upset and freaked out and yeah. concerned that this wasn't being handled, thank you, appropriately. Yeah, or a group of us went. Went to the site. Yeah, I went to the site. Below the McKay Bridge. Exactly. Okay. Because we, it didn't make sense in our minds and it made less sense when we actually walked the alleged walk. Holly used a cane to get around. Peter's job was to teach her new routes through the city. As an orientation and mobility specialist, I taught blind and partially sighted adults how to travel safely and independently. She had the best skills of any client I had ever worked with. Peter, his father Brian, and friends of Holly's began looking into what happened on their own. They called their group Justice for Holly. I started in the policing world. I worked criminal investigations most of my career, retired from the military, and opened uh, my own investigation company. I guess we're going to do another left turn up Polly's uh, driveway. When I first heard from the police about what they thought happened, I just said it made no sense from an orientation mobility standpoint, knowing Holly's skills. When the police interviewed the taxi driver, he said Holly got out of the driver's side door, furthest away from the building. If the theory was correct, how would she have handled this? Well, first of all, she would get out of the right side like she did so many times, but if she started walking away and didn't contact the door or the curb really quick, she would know she was going the wrong way then. This is where she lived. It would have been so automatic for her to get out the right side. 
When she walked away from the cab, she walked the opposite direction to her apartment building. She went down the road. This decline is actually so obvious. Well, I can feel it. You feel yourself sliding forward almost it's, in your shoes as you come down uh, the hill. It's quite a when Holly first of all would be walking down her driveway, which is a decline, she'd be walking towards that traffic. So we'd call that perpendicular traffic in front of her. It's coming around the corner here on the Northridge. So you've turned the corner and you're Holly. So, what do you hear? So now the traffic that was perpendicular is now parallel, parallel on the left side. Having the parallel traffic on the left would mean that we're walking away from her driveway. What do you think the odds are if she came down that hillside, she'd know the bridge was above her? You're hearing traffic go over a bridge right now. So she'd know exactly where she was if she got this far? I think so. I'm still grasping with why would you get a cab ride home where it's safe, yeah. know you got let out where it's safe, and then make this walk to here. It doesn't make any sense. Would a blind person go where they don't know where they're going? Uh, no. Would it make sense for them to crawl up to a fence or go to a fence and try to crawl through a hole? It makes no sense to me. They didn't stop to see how somebody who is blind would function. If you don't know how a, a blind person functions, how do you investigate that? How can you have a theory that she made this trek all the way to the bridge and did all the things that they alleged that she did or they believed? They tried to prove their assumptions instead of proving the case. When the police found Holly, Holly's cane was nowhere to be seen. According to police records, they searched the area where Holly was found that Saturday morning. But when their first searches were conducted, the officers didn't even know Holly used a cane in her everyday life. The police were talking to us and I said, well, did you find her cane? And he said, no, we didn't find her cane. And I said, well, she, she didn't go anywhere without her cane. So you find her cane and that'll tell you everything. Holly died on Sunday, March 28th, 2010. Hi. Hi, nice to meet you, Rendell. Rendell. That same day, only hours later, Rendell Pittman was searching through the brush along the steep hill leading below the bridge and all around that area where police had already removed their yellow tape. At the time, we were able to walk along the edge of the building here. Right. And uh, there's a clear path. Right. And all the the bushes and stuff I see have grown up a lot oh, quite since a bit. then. Yeah. Quite a bit. It was mostly small shrubbery. As we uh, came down along, so we got to get down closer to the fence. Yeah. So we. Uh, it's like loose rock here. Yeah. We came down around and uh, walked around. This fence wasn't there, but it was right there. Right there. At that time of year, there was no leaves around. Yeah, I found it. I have found Holly Bartlett's cane inside of the fence behind an apartment building. But she was found on the other side of the fence. This is Holly Bartlett's cane. Once we saw it and found it, you could easily see it from from up on top of the bank. Right. Uh, so if the police it. went around like they said they did, they would have seen it. Exactly, yeah. If the cane really was sitting there all day Saturday, that entire night, and the next morning, wouldn't somebody have seen it? And how could police have missed it when Rendell Pittman and his family came across it so easily? How is it that Halifax police a dog and all these experts were there and they didn't see this. It begs the question, where did her cane come from? How come her cane wasn't there at five o'clock on Saturday, but at five o'clock on Sunday, it was there in plain view? Why would Holly have left her cane there? Why was it out of her backpack? How do you think the cane got there? If she had to drop it, it would have been on the ground. The way it was placed, stood up like that, it looked to me like it was staged. 
Rendell and his family waited two hours for police to arrive. This appears in police documents too. Photographs were taken and the evidence was seized. If somebody dropped it there afterwards, why would they have put it so visibly? Why risk the possibility of being caught or seen? There had to be people in that apartment building looking out the window at what the police were doing yeah. there. They had to have watched it. And that cane, if it was that visible, should have been spotted. Yeah. Thanks for coming. I'm Maggie. Maggie, nice to meet you. Really nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. So, Kelly, when was this the building that you ran? 2007 to 2015. Tell us about when you found out that it was Holly. Oh, I remember it was a Friday night that this had happened. Right. Uh, I typically would have done my rounds around midnight, outside and then inside. Even I in the winter? Yes, oh yes. But that night, I did my rounds around 11. And I came back here. Nothing came around the front and then the sides. There were some people on that side of the building, no having cigarettes. It's a Friday night. Right, right. Uh, people were on their balconies. I went to sleep until about 2 a.m. and uh, I was up in my unit and I didn't hear a thing. I didn't hear anything. nothing. Nothing. Just supposing if she had been down there, if she called out for help, do you think it's possible that anybody along this wall? if they happen to have their windows open like you did at the time, would have heard something? Absolutely. Midnight is not late, you know, around here on a, on a weekend night. Yeah. yeah. Did the police ever reach out to you? God, it was a couple of months later. A couple of months? I believe so, yeah, it was two or three months later. I had said that I had seen or heard nothing. What about security cameras? Anything like that uh, back here? Well, at that time, I did have one in the back here. Those have uh, since been discarded. Nobody asked you about security uh, cameras Nobody at the asked time? me about it, no. The no. police, when they came to... No. 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 So the security cameras, I'm really curious as to, it would just look over the parking lot. It yeah. wouldn't necessarily see down like by where she was found or anything like no. that. No, it was, it was a wide angle uh, camera that caught the whole parking lot. To learn that there was a camera that could have been reviewed immediately, that nobody ever asked for it or reviewed it, is just unbelievable. The footage could have been everything to see what was on it or even what wasn't. police had said that her friends said that she was the drunkest that they'd ever seen her. Obviously, you need to determine, is that the case? Did she really have that much to drink? Just going to come up here on the right in the location where the fireside used to be. She went out to dinner with Moira. Yeah. By her account, it had two drinks. So you got to remember, too, she'd consume food while she was having her, her yeah. drink. So there was something there for the, the alcohol. And then they left there. They walked down the road to the liquor store. So Sorry. this is what, what used to be the Clyde Street Sorry. liquor store. They purchased a bottle of wine. They went to Jeff Brown's house party where they consumed the, the bottle of wine. And then we know that somebody had made a martini and that person didn't like it. And Holly had said that she'd like to try it. So she tasted it, but whether she consumed it or not, we're not sure. Then they left shortly thereafter until they went to the graduation party ceremonies. They basically walked arm in arm and Myra said that they were both a little tipsy. And when we got to the function, Holly insisted on having another drink. Following that, she was seen seated drinking water. So that was the last of the alcohol that we could track, and that was through the witnesses that were there at the graduation as well. This is an important detail that Holly had switched to water. 
by all accounts, it looks like she was slowing down, getting ready to call it a night. She could have stayed out partying. She could have kept drinking. But Holly had plans the next morning with her study group. She was going to visit her dad later. She made the first call for a taxi at 11.18 p.m., but Holly wanted to stay. And the first taxi was either canceled or ignored. The second cab was called at 11.55 p.m. Erica led Holly outside to it. And when I asked her, did you have any reason to believe that Holly was intoxicated beyond the point of being able to do things normally or function normally? And uh, she said no, or she would have never let her go in the cab. And when I asked her when she left the function, did you have to help her up the stairs? She said, no, only guide her. And that was it. She had steady walk and she had coherent speech. And we were able to track five, possibly six drinks between right. six and midnight. It just didn't amount to drunk blind girl gets disoriented. We all know that a man who's 6'4 and 225 pounds, scientifically, is better equipped to handle six drinks over the course of six hours. Holly was tiny. She was 4'11", weighed just over 100 pounds. I'm Jim Wigmore. Hi, Jim. I'm a toxicologist. I was wondering if you could summarize your findings. According to the, the, the toxicology report, the alcohol level was slightly over the legal limit at the time the blood was taken. So if Holly was just over the legal limit for driving at 10.30 a.m., what would the blood alcohol level be 10 hours earlier? She would have eliminated, at a low rate, 10 milligrams of alcohol in 100 milliliters of blood per hour. Holly's reading would have been around 190, which is about two and a half times the legal driving limit. The alcohol level that you get depends on your height, age, weight, and gender, basically. Yes. I was also given that she was observed to have approximately six drinks. Those six drinks would give her a much higher blood alcohol concentration than a large male. It's impossible for us to comment on how her body specifically tolerated and metabolized alcohol, and we'll never know exactly what her experience of drunkenness was that night. It was a cold winter's night. It was minus six degrees. It was windy. The ground was frozen. Would alcohol really be enough to explain why Holly would wander down this long path and end up crawling through a hole in the fence? Is it possible to tell, based on the figures, whether somebody was disoriented or not? So you have alcohol intoxication, which would cause some disorientation. Then as we have increasing uh, hypothermia, the brain starts shutting down and you start having bizarre behavior you can't have. Some victims, before they die, will take their clothes off. Some will hide underneath holes. It's called a tunneling syndrome. What's happening is your body, in reaction to the cold, cuts off the blood supply to the arms and legs. Now, the problem with alcohol is it causes blood flow to the arms and the legs. Your body's trying to right. prevent the cold loss, but alcohol's stopping that. So you're more likely to have hypothermia with alcohol than without alcohol and have it induced at a faster rate because you're losing all that heat. When Holly was found, she was fully clothed. There was no evidence of disrobing, of tunneling. She exhibited none of those signs or symptoms. In 2010, the abutments were in a fenced area that was locked. To the north of the fence is the look-off overlooking Africville Park. To the east are the roads right alongside the coastline overlooking the water. To the south, is the fence line that rests below the parking lot at Kencrest Apartment Building, where it joins the west side fence, and that runs alongside the footpath that leads to Africville Park. If that is our, is that a, is our focal point right there? Right. I'm just trying to look at all the different avenues she could have right. followed to come down in here. 
My entire career was spent as a police officer, 15 years of it as a homicide investigator. We want to get up on top of the abutment to see exactly where they suggest Holly went. This is a hell of an event. Yeah, it's very steep. <laughs> wow, I can't Holly would know this, right? Ah, uh, yeah. Her alarm bells would be going off if she took a few steps up this slope. Also, again, the sound of the bridge traffic, which is, well, different. You can kind of tell you're under the sound. But holy steep. Yeah. I can't imagine taking a... The degree, the degree of angle is a lot more than I ever thought. Yeah. I can't imagine taking more than a couple steps before you turn around. So if she came in from this side... How do you know that? According to the police. OK. Then she would have had to come across, right? Oh, wow. OK, so according to the police, she came in through this fence. Yeah. Well, if she came in here, why the hell would she walk all the way around the other side of this thing? Yeah, right. exactly. Why yeah. not walk up that ramp? Yeah. It's the most closest to her entry point, so that's logical. Either went around the back. Yeah. Or around the front. But why? Why is she here? What the hell is she doing yeah. up here? Why is yeah. she here? Why is she here? Yeah. Right. That is the most secluded spot in that entire building. It would be the darkest right there. spot. Yeah. You're behind that little nook. No windows. Parking lots over here. No That's lights. the most secluded, isolated spot in that whole building. And the cane just happens to be found below here. Mm. I do not believe in questions. Mm. I think we can just walk up. Okay. Here we go. I think this is more than 20 feet down. They estimated she was found. Right where that pole is in the corner. 12 and a half feet out. So if she crawled, as they say, that's quite a steep, long crawl. But as you're crawling, of course, your hands are going first. Why yeah, would you right. keep going after your hand reached, reached a drop off? I mean, she would have to know. There's nothing have... there. Yeah. I can't see how she could, unless she walked up. But if she went hands and knees. But why would she, though? Even think about, like, at this angle. Like, what would what would make you think that you were the heading angle is surprising. somewhere? The angle is very surprising. To me. Even if she's intoxicated. Yeah. She's going worse, to know right? something is not right here. Yeah. Wouldn't you be more likely to go off a side than all the ways to the top if you were to fall, you know? Well, uh, if you're going to the top, what are you going to? Yeah, exactly. You know, some will say, oh, she's walking towards the traffic. Yeah, yeah. But she would know better than that. The taxi yeah. dropped her off at home. Why is she walking towards traffic? Yeah. If, in fact, Holly came up here, if you give it a rub, see that white dust? Yeah. That's cement dust. So her pants, if she came up on her hands and knees, would have cement dust. Do you think they yeah. would still be there now? Sure, why not? Because Marion... the pants weren't washed. Marion has them. If we can test her clothing and her shoes, we might be able to confirm whether she was actually on that abutment or not. Court's concerned, any continuity with this stuff is gone. All I know is none of this stuff was washed, and that's important to me. So there's two areas we'd be looking uh, for right. material. One would be on the knees of her pants, and the other would be the toes of her shoes. I want to look at the shoes first. OK, the first thing I notice, there is a pattern of scrapes, for lack of a better word. It's all discoloration. That means it's been done for a while. 
this all looks fairly old to me. If Holly would have gone up that ramp on her hands and knees, the toes would be dragging. I would expect to see those toes torn to hell. It's almost not as much what you see on them, but what you don't see when you're talking about the toes in particular. Yeah, if you look at the ends where the vinyl was barked off it, it's all dark in color. Now that looks fresher. See how it's a lighter color? It's going in the other direction. Yeah. The thing that sticks out about that side of her shoe, there's not much there. So what you would expect to see given the journey that she it, is, you know, purported to have gone on that night, that this is not adding up at first glance. No. So we're looking at her pants. Okay, so it's a tear. Another tear. Same direction. If you're crawling through a hole in the fence, call me crazy, but you'd think it would go the other way, like vertically. That's assuming it came from the fence. Right. Well, that's, yes. I mean. That could be a rock. That could be yeah. glass. It could be anything. And if you look at her buttocks area, and we have what I assume looks like dirt radiate between both sides of her buttocks. This would be slightly below the knee. Yeah. So I'm standing on the front here. And what about the concrete dust you spoke of? When we're concrete the dust, bed? and I would guess that would be around the knee somewhere. This would be in the area of her knee, in this area here. Mm. There's nothing visible here. Mm -hmm. To the naked eye, there's no concrete dust on the knees of Holly's jeans. There's no scuff marks on her boots. It doesn't look like there's any trace to suggest that she did crawl up that abutment. I tried to secure an interview with the chief medical examiner of Nova Scotia, Dr. Matt Bowes, and the doctor who performed Holly's autopsy, Dr. Marnie Wood. They wouldn't talk to me, but they did talk to Tom. The first thing I wanted to clear up was, did Holly have leg fractures? Mm -hmm. As it turns out, the radiologist did find two on her left leg and one on her right. So like compression fractures? No, no. You're looking at them, it's a crack in the bone serious enough that they would probably cast it. We started going through the post-mortem pictures and the legs, specifically around her knees, considerable bruisings and, and abrasions. Buttocks on the right side had a fairly substantial bruise and on the left buttocks, there was two or three equally substantial bruises, but they were smaller. I can't imagine that bruising would be the result of a fall that severe. You just look at the height and you picture a compressed spine or a spinal cord injury, shattered bones. This doesn't look to me like a fall from 20 feet to the frozen earth. Regarding Holly's head, I do not recall seeing any abnormalities pertaining to the exterior of the skull. Personally, as an investigator, I find that interesting because mm -hmm. in cases where you have death caused by blunt force trauma to the head, that's the key location. You usually see some type of bruising, bleeding, hematoma, something, nothing. Overview of the brain there was a subdural hemorrhage present at the base of the skull, so at the back of the brain, mm -hmm. uh, oriented more towards the right side. So, what you're saying is on the, the outside, cranial. there was nothing visible. No, except but for there, this the, one little... Except that spot. That one little spot. And then the rest of the damage was internal, like actually inside? Uh, yes. The brain, okay. Yeah. Dr. Wood advises that uh, these types of trauma injuries to the brain are caused by falls or impact to the head area, not specific. It yeah. could be being hit by something, it could be tripping and falling. One of the things that jumped out at me first was the palms of Holly's hands. Palms are almost, I'd say, almost pristine, but when you look at the backs of her hands, mm -hmm. that's where you start seeing scrapes and picks and cuts, and all of the wounds on the hand require a closer look. 
The face injuries, I think, are the ones that took me off guard the most. I didn't recognize Holly when I saw her in mm. the, the, the face shots from the morgue because of swelling yeah. and discoloration, bruising and, and cuts and contusions to her, her lips, both inside and outside. Mm -hmm. And you mean the, the... Mouth injuries. <sighs> yeah. It was a sub substantial blow to this area, but a fall, a hit or something, we don't know. With the face being the receiving location, if you're falling, you know, you picture like putting your hands out. If you take an, a child or an 80-year-old person, and if they start to fall or if they jump, the hands always come out to the side. It's played, yeah. It's just, it's the way we are wired. Mm. How do you get injuries on the back of your hands? Let me ask you this question. Have you ever put your hands up in front of your face to protect it? Mm. Like this? Yeah. For what? You know, fighting with someone. Mm, OK. Instinct is to go like this. To me, it's a conscious thought to cover your face like that. This changes everything. If Dr. Wood can be convinced that Holly's death wasn't a fatal accident, if we can provide evidence that disproves that theory, the medical examiner's office can reclassify the manner of death and compel the police to reopen the investigation. And there's one other thing we need to look into, the last known person to see Holly alive, and that's the taxi driver. In 2010, Brian spoke with police about Paul Fraser, the taxi driver who drove Holly home that night. I believe it was their first trip with him where they rode in the back of his taxi cab. This is what he had told two police was it was a normal fare. He picked her up. She was helped in the vehicle by others, and he drove her home. She paid him, got out of the cab, walked across the street in the wrong direction, and he drove off. And their first take on it was that Paul Fraser was the salt of the earth. My dad began his own investigation for the family. As he went to the scene, he saw that at the bottom of Holly's driveway, there's a number seven yeah. bus that sits there. That number seven bus is the bus, by the way, that Holly would catch every morning to go to work. Brian's idea was, what if there was a bus waiting there near Convoy Towers when Holly was dropped off that night? And if there was, did the bus driver see anything? It turns out Brian was right. There was a number seven bus waiting there when Holly was dropped off that night. And it was equipped with a video camera. I tried to get the, the bus video with no luck. We pushed to find out where it was and uh, could we see it. But the police said no. They couldn't give it to him for privacy reasons. So when he handed the case back to the police, that was his advice. First thing you need to do is yeah. watch this bus video. I insisted, I asked, will you please watch it in its entirety, everything, not just when the cab comes in and goes back out end of case, watch the rest of it. They reviewed that video. Now, I never did see the video, but this is what they said. We saw the cab sitting at the intersection of Camp Crest and Noble Lee, waiting to turn right, right signal light on. So it should have been long gone. They'd be off to another fair. Right. Or whatever, on a Friday night at midnight. He was turned around like as if he was coming back towards Holly's condo. The police determined that he did come back. Mm -hmm. 
so they needed to interview him again to find out why he admitted that the first time. He then says, well, I'm not proud of something I did that night. When she walked away from the cab, she walked uh, the opposite direction to her apartment building. She tripped on the curb and fell. And so he said, I went down the road and almost immediately turned around and came back to check on her. Within two minutes, as we discovered later. The police then went to the theory, well, she tripped on the curb, must have fallen and hit her head, and added to her impaired state and her disorientation, and now she's really in trouble. Police had said to me, I, I know you're going to want to talk to him, and we've already told him you'll probably be calling him. So I called Mr. Fraser. I met with him at his house. I knew right off the bat something was, was strange. He had just spoken to police about it, and they had just told him that I was going to be there to ask him questions about this. He played it almost um, that he didn't know. He couldn't remember. Like He said, oh, was that, did that happen back in May? He was very evasive. He had said that he didn't tell police that Holly was drunk when uh, he took her home. However, the police had told me the cab driver knew that she was intoxicated. He said he didn't stop anywhere. He gave me the description of the street, the travel, how they got to, to Holly's apartment building. So I asked him at that point if he would accompany me over to the site so we could look at this in detail and he could show me exactly how it transpired. He had told me that he had lied to police. We saw her get into the cab, but he focused on the fact that he had never looked at her. He said she slid right over behind him. They drove all the way home. There was no conversation whatsoever. She never spoke to him. He said she was just busy. She was rummaging in her, her purse the whole time. And I said, what do you suppose she was looking for? And he said, uh, she might have been looking for her cane. And I looked at him, paused for a moment, and he said, oh, wait, I, I, I couldn't have known that. I didn't know she was blind. Someone must have planted that in my mind. He had dropped her off, that she had tripped. He had left, returned. He said she wasn't anywhere to be seen. And I said, where do you suppose she got to so quick if she was disoriented? He said, uh, I don't know, maybe she hid herself. And I said, why would she hide herself? He said, I have no idea. I said, show me exactly where you turned. He accompanied me, sat in the passenger seat. We drove up to where it was. We went down to where he turned around. And as I turned into the area that he said he turned, it was a roadway that led behind the apartment building. As I turned into this parking area, he said, I turned right here and I drove on down over the hill. He put both feet on the floor very hard and both hands on the dash and said, I've never been down in here. I don't know where this goes. It was serious concern in his voice at that point when he said it. Following that, we left and uh, came back around to where we could look into the compound from a park bench. We sat there for a few minutes, and I told him that I believed the theory that the police had was totally inaccurate, and that he knew a lot more than he was letting on, and I said I could tell something was weighing heavy on his chest. He sat there quiet for a moment, And then he said, uh, there is something. I said, uh, and what is that? And I let him talk. He said, I ripped her off. I stole from her that night. 
And I said, you stole from Holly. And he said, yes. So I said, now you took a normal fare home. Now you see a girl trip and fall, following the story you told police. Then you now have stolen from her. I said, that's interesting. I said, what else happened? He said, that's it. There's one more piece of the puzzle that I can't make sense of. Some of Holly's belongings were found in the parking lot of her condo, including her wallet, which was empty. How did those items get up there when she was found under the bridge? After reviewing the case and conducting interviews, Tom Martin has finished his investigation and he's ready to share with us now what he believes took place on the night of Friday, March 26, 2010. This is not fact. This is the result of reviewing the evidence that we have available to us, putting it all together based on the balance of probabilities. It's always heavy to go back to those days when you're sort of reenacting it in your head. I want to know exactly what took place that night. We know the cab came up to this area. Mm -hmm. There's a high probability he pulled down in this area. It's out of the way, it's quiet. He stops. I believe there's a very low probability that Holly Bartlett was ever driven to the front door of her residence. Holly was in tune enough that she would have known that this cab, if it did take this right turn, took it. She would know we should have turned left. And I think they engaged in a conversation, a heated conversation. That conversation escalated into an argument. If there was a confrontation of some kind, then she would have reacted not too kindly to that. And at some point, some items fell out of Holly's purse. And I think the cane landed on the floor of the cab. Tom believes after an altercation of some kind took place, Holly either raced out of the cab or was forced out. What's the first thing Holly's going to hear? It's as obvious as the nose on your face. Holly following her sound cues, which is how she's trained, correct, Peter? Right. She knows if she keeps that on her right, she's heading home. Before, none of it made any sense to me. It makes more sense that Holly would be keeping the bridge on her right, knowing that that was the way home. She's in a panic. Holly does not have her cane. She's going to come to a wall that sticks out in that building. To go around it, she would have to walk towards the bridge traffic and then make a left-hand turn through a very narrow passageway. At this point, anywhere between here and that wall, I believe, is when Holly went down over this edge. You could have made contact with any number of rocks or trees or stumps or anything else that was there. She has some very serious injuries at this point. We have Holly at the fence now, conscious, semi-conscious, dazed, who knows? So she would have had to move along the fence line course of doing so would have came across that one opening that was between the ground and the bottom of the fence. She made her way into that fenced-in compound. She made her way over as far as the front of that far embutment, and I think that's where she laid down. And I think the point where she went down was where she was recovered the next morning. When Holly was found, she did not have her wallet. She did not have her cell phone. She did not have her money or her credit cards. But most importantly, she didn't have her cane. The cane being found the following day in a spot that was searched by a multitude of police officers, twice by a canine unit, and yet all of a sudden now it's back into the scene. Now somebody else had done the work and figured out who Holly was and knew that 
in, in your, their heart of hearts, it could never have happened the way that we were told. It made me feel that I wasn't crazy to think that something different had happened than, than what the original theory was. And to confirm that my sister wasn't this drunk idiot who didn't take care of herself. Because it's about defending her honor too. As a family, we will never, ever forget what happened. You're never going to get peace with it, but at least someone looked at it and gave Holly the dignity to, to look into further what really, truly happened. I would really like for the cause of Holly's death to be ruled suspicious as opposed to accidental. I would really like for the police department to reopen this case based on that. I don't know if I'll ever get that wish, but we'll see.